critique of the illusion of privacy. Quoting Blaise Pascal, Where is this ego, then, if it is neither in the body nor in the soul? The last great attack of critique against illusion aims at the position of the ego between nature and society. We know from the line of thought in the preceding critiques that knowledge, erkentness, does not have to do with human nature, pure and simple, but with nature as conception, nature as fabrication, with unnatural nature. In that which is given in nature, there is always something given in addition by human beings. The labour of reflection is summarised in this insight. Modernity establishes itself in our minds in the shape of counterintuitive experiences that break through naivete and exercise a peculiar compulsion on us to increase our intelligence. Ideologically, the reference to nature is always significant because it produces an artificial naivety and ends up as voluntary naivety. It covers up the human contribution and avers that things are by nature and from their origins in that order in which our representations, which are always influenced by interests, depict them. The rudiments for ideologies of order are hidden in all naturalisms. Every naturalism begins as involuntary naivety. Initially, we cannot help thinking that the order of things is an objective order, for the first glance falls on the things and not on the eyeglasses. In the work of enlightenment, this first innocence becomes irretrievably lost. Enlightenment leads to the loss of naivety, and it furthers the collapse of objectivism through a gain in self-experience. It affects an irreversible awakening and, expressed pictorially, executes the turn of the eyeglasses, i.e. to one's own rational apparatus. Once this consciousness of the eyeglasses has been awakened in a culture, the old naivety loses its charms, becomes defensive, and is transformed into narrow-mindedness, which is intent on remaining as it is. The mythology of the Greeks is still enchanting. That of fascism is only stale and shameless. In the first myth, a step towards an interpretation of the world was taken. In simulated naivety, an artful stupefaction, verdummung, is at work. The predominant method of self-integration in advanced social orders. Such an observation touches only superficially on the role of mythology in modernity. For the moment this will suffice. Artful self-stupefaction manifests itself in a whole range of modern naturalisms. Racism, sexism, fascism, vulgar biologism and... Egoism. To put egoism in the series may at first glance seem strange. Indeed, even dangerous. Actually, there is an egoism, a natural givenness of a special kind. The critique of egoism, better, the critique of the illusion of privacy, constitutes, I think, the core of all enlightenment in which the self-experience of civilized egos comes to maturity. After it, there can be, logically, no other uncovering critique but only praxis, conscious life. How does the ego come to its determinations? What constitutes its character? What creates the material of its self-experience? The answer runs as follows. The ego is a result of programming. It is formed in emotional, practical, moral and political drill. Quoting Alice Miller, in the beginning was education. Self-experience proceeds in two stages, naive perception and reflection. In the naive stage, no consciousness can do otherwise than to conceive of its character traits, programming and training as its own. 
whether in the case of impressions, feelings or opinions, at first it must always say, I am so, my feeling is thus, my attitude is thus, I am as I am. In the reflective stage, self-consciousness becomes clear about itself. My programming, my traits, my training are thus. I have been brought up in this way, and have become so. My mechanisms function thus. What I am and what I am not are both at work in me in this way. The establishment of inwardness and the creation of the illusion of privacy are the most subversive themes of enlightenment. It is still not really clear today who the social conveyor of this impulse of enlightenment may be. One of the ambivalences of enlightenment is that, although intelligence can be explained sociologically, educationally and politically, wisdom, self-reflection, cannot. The subject of a radical ego enlightenment cannot be socially identified with certainty, even though the procedures of this enlightenment are anchored in reality. In this point, the majority of societies seem to strive for a conscious non-enlightenment. Did not Nietzsche too warn us? Did not Nietzsche too warn of that life-destroying enlightenment? That touches on our life-supporting self-delusions? Can we afford to shake up the basic fictions of privacy, personality and identity? Well, be that as it may, in this question both old and new conservatives have come to the hard decision to take the stance of defending, against all the demands of reflection, their unavoidable lies for living, without which self-preservation would not be possible. That they are aided in this by the general fear of self-experience, which competes with curiosity about self-experience, does not have to be expressly emphasised. Thus the theatre of respectable, closed egos goes on everywhere, even where the means have long ago, have long been available to secure better knowledge. Crosswise to all political fronts, it is the ego in society that offers the most resolute resistance against the decisive enlightenment. Scarcely anyone will put up with radical self-reflection on this point. Not even many of those who regard themselves as enlighteners. The dance around the golden calf of identity is the last and greatest orgy of counter-enlightenment. Identity is the magic word of a partially hidden, partially open conservatism that has inscribed personal identity, occupational identity, national identity, political identity, female identity, male identity, class identity, party identity, etc., etc., on its banner. The listing of these essential demands for identity would already suffice to illustrate the pluralistic and mobile character of that which is called identity. But one would not be speaking of identity if it were not basically a question of the fixed form of the ego. The establishment of inwardness comprises the ego as the bearer of ethics, the erotic, aesthetics and politics. In these four dimensions, everything that I experience as mine is given to me, though at first I was not asked. My norms of behaviour my professional ethics, my sexual patterns, my sensual, emotional modes of experience, my class identity, my political interests. Here I want to begin with the last mentioned. By briefly describing the political narcissisms of the aristocracy, the bourgeois and the proletariat, I will show how even in the most inner region, where we suppose ourselves to be in the closest narcissistic proximity to ourselves, we encounter at the same time the most external and most universal. Here the game of one's own self with what is alien becomes visible in the public heart of personalities. Precisely the analysis of narcissism can show how the other has already got the better of the ego. I look in the mirror and see a stranger who swears that it is me, 
It is one of the irresistible ironies of enlightenment that it shatters our consciousness with such radical counterintuitions. In concluding this line of thought, I want to simply suggest for consideration the question whether the last level of integration and enlightenment does not have to be a kind of rational mysticism. The ego enters the political world never as a private individual, but it is a member of a group, an estate or a class. From time immemorial, the members of the aristocracy have known themselves to be the best. Their social and political position is based on an open, demonstrative and self-satisfied relation between power and self-esteem. The political narcissism of the aristocracy is nourished by this plain, power-conscious presumption. The aristocracy has been allowed to believe that it is favoured in every existentially essential respect and is called on to excel, to be militarily stronger, aesthetically superior, culturally refined, unbroken in vitality, which only with regard to the courtly aristocracy is no longer quite true. Thus, in the function of the aristocracy, there is initially nothing that would allow one to suggest that political status destroys vitality. In fact, the nobility often tried to base its cultural self-portrait directly on narcissistic pleasure. Its political aesthetic culture is based on the motif of self-celebration, or the union of self-consciousness and festival. The everyday form of this narcissistic class consciousness appears in the concept of the noble's honour, and in the idea of a noble life style. With the smallest affronts to their highly trained sense of honour, aristocrats must demand satisfaction, which precipitates the history of the duel and symbolic combat in Europe as well as in Asia. Honour was the bond between emotion and public life, between the innermost life of the best and the reality of life among the best as well as in public view of the common people. Rules of greeting obsequious forms of behaviour, and even grammatical structures, which are unknown in pre-feudal languages, the most striking being the honorific forms in Japanese, can be traced back to these claims of domination, honour, and personal pleasure. The aristocratic programming of a heightened self-consciousness, however, comprises more than just what is too hastily called vanity or arrogance. It provides at the same time a high level of character formation and education that works to form opinions, etiquette, emotionality and cultural taste. All these moments are still encompassed in the old concept of courtliness. Hufflekeit, politeness. The courtly person, cortegiano, gentilhomme, gentleman, Hoffman, has gone through a training in self-esteem that expresses itself in many ways, in aristocratically pretentious opinions, in polished or majestic manners, in gallant or heroic patterns of feeling, as well as in selective aesthetic sensitivity for that which is said to be courtly or pretty. The noble, far removed from any self-doubt, should achieve all this with a complete matter-of-factness. Any uncertainty, any doubt in these things signifies a slacking in the noble's cultural identity. This class narcissism, which is petrified into a form of life, tolerates no irony, no exception, no slips, because such disturbances would give rise to unwelcome reflections. The French nobles did not turn up their noses at Shakespeare's barbarism without reason. In his plays, one already smells the human ordinariness of those who want to stand before society as the best. With the ascendancy of the bourgeois, the place of the best is awarded anew. <clears throat> the bourgeois ego, in an unprecedented, creative storming to the heights of a new class consciousness, won for itself an autonomous narcissism in whose period of degeneration we are living today.
It is for this reason we have to suffer so much political and cultural depressiveness. The bourgeois found its own way of being better than the others, better than the corrupt nobility and the uncultivated mob. At first its class ego raised itself on the feeling of having the better, purer, more rational and more useful morality in all areas of life, from sexuality to management. For a whole century, the new bourgeois wallowed in moralizing literature. In it, a new political collective learns to say, I, in a special way, whether psychologically and aesthetically, as in that sensitivity that schools itself for natural beauty, intimate sociability, and empathy with heart-rending fates, whether politically and scientifically, as in that bourgeois public sphere that starts as a republic of the learned in order to end up as a republic of citizens. Literature, the diary, gregariousness, critique, science and republicanism are all training grounds for a new bourgeois high ego, for a new will to subjectivity. Only here do citizens learn how to have good taste, proper demeanour, opinions and will. Here the class-specific, novel, high feelings of bourgeois culture are drilled. The pleasure of being a citizen. The awareness of progress. The pride in having worked up from the bottom and in having come a long way. The pride in being the moral and historical torchbearer. The joy in one's own moral sensibility. The demonstrative pleasure in one's own cultivation. The pleasure in having a simultaneously cultivated and naive feeling about nature. The self-admiration of the class for its musical, poetic and scientific genius. The joy in the enterprise, invention and historical movement. Finally, the triumph of gaining a political say. Looking back at the 18th and 19th centuries, one now gets an idea of the extent to which creative or coquettish narcissism permeates bourgeois culture. At the same time, however, the bourgeois also followed the nobility in essential respects, not least of all in its concept of honour, through which the duel came into bourgeois life and even into the realm of student life. Without doubt, honour became for the bourgeois too an essential socio-narcissistic factor with which the national militarization of bourgeois society is connected. That this type of bourgeois is dying out today is felt in every nook and cranny of civilization. Those who still know such a latecomer should regard themselves as ethnologists. With wonder they may hear how the last specimens, even today, cannot walk through a forest without speaking of God. The neo-bourgeois generations have modernised their social narcissism. Since at least the Weimar years, the collective ego tone of the bourgeois has been loosening up. A lazier style of ego being as bourgeois is becoming prevalent everywhere. Today we find the node of expression of the last surviving cultivated bourgeois horribly artificial and everyone has had the urge to tell them to their faces that they should not ramble on the way they do, so full of themselves. In the 20th century, we observe a socio-psychological front between two bourgeois ego styles, the older and a newer type, which are extremely allergic to each other. The threshold between the two types runs roughly through the time of the First World War, and the following phrase of modernization, in the mutual dislike of, say, Thomas Mann and Bertold Brecht, this front becomes concretely visible. In the mutual dislike of, say, Thomas Mann and Bertold Brecht, this front becomes concretely visible. From a historical perspective, the bourgeois is the first class that has learned to say I, and that at the same time has the experience of labour. And all older class narcissisms can base themselves only on struggle, military heroism and the grandiosity of rulers. 
when the bourgeois says I, the idea of the pride of labour, of productive accomplishment, can also be heard for the first time. The ego of a labouring class introduces a previously unheard of turn towards realism into higher social feelings. Of course, that cannot be seen clearly from the beginning because bourgeois culture was forced to distinguish between poetry and prose, art and life, the ideal and reality. The consciousness of labour and the bourgeois ego is still thoroughly split into an idealistic and a pragmatic fraction. The one version of the bourgeois comprises the artisan, the trader, <coughs> the trader, the official, the financier and the entrepreneur, all of whom in their own way can claim to know what labour is. Juxtaposed to them from the beginning stands a type of bourgeois who does research, writes poetry, composes and makes music, and philosophizes, and who believes that these activities develop a world that is self-sufficient. <laughs> Probably podcasters fit into that as well. <clears throat> it is obvious that these two fractions of the bourgeois ego get on only superficially, and come together only in the hollow connection of property and cultivation. They create the century-long tension between the good and the evil bourgeois, the idealist and the exploiter, the visionary and the pragmatist, the ideally liberated bourgeois and the labouring bourgeois. This tension remains as inexhaustible as that between the world of work and freedom in general. Even a large part of socialism to date has been only the renewal of the inner bourgeois conflict between the idealistic citoyen and the detestable bourgeois. But even the bourgeois experience of labour is not so straightforward as the bourgeois would like to have it. The bourgeois, who, as subjects of power, say I, because they also labour and are creative, express only formally and illusorily the truth for everybody. They want others to forget that their way of labouring is arranged in a questionable way. This holds especially for the genuine bourgeois in the sphere of labour, the entrepreneurs, the capitalists and financiers. Their consciousness of labour is so inconsistent that, since the late 19th century, it is difficult not to speak of lying. For if labour were really what creates a right to a political ego, what about those who labour for bourgeois labourers? The situation of the proletariat, which, during a great part of the 19th century and in segments of the 20th, was deprived of its rights, prevented bourgeois society from coming to rest. Precisely the principle of achievement, success and privileges for the more diligent, became undermined in the course of the development Labour is liberating was a slogan that sounded more and more cynical with the passing of each decade, until finally it was written above the entrance of Auschwitz. The pleasure in being a citizen combined in the 18th and 19th century with the compulsion to politics and a new kind of political complex of feelings that for the past 200 years has seemed to countless individuals to be the innermost and most spontaneous impulse of their ego, the love of the fatherland. What began as patriotic spontaneity was methodically organised in the 19th century as a political ideology, which in the 20th century heated up into a political system of madness. The European nationalisms were indeed complexes of convictions and passions that individuals found in themselves, as though given by nature, complexes to which they could say in a primary naivety and honesty, that is me, that is how my innermost self feels, that is how my most intimate political reason stirs itself. For Germans, empathy with such naively wonderful patriotisms is actually only still possible when we meet people from foreign countries, 
who live in the first dawning of patriotic self-reflection and who can still claim for themselves a primal innocence. How many German left-wingers did not stand by with a pensive and uneasy smile when Chilean socialist émigrés sang songs that ended with the refrain, Fatherland or Death? It has been a long time since Germans could hear a mutual resonance of progressive and patriotic motives. The reaction has incorporated national feeling for too long. 200 years ago, things looked a little different. The first patriotic generations, the French, who, after the revolution, felt their national existence threatened by the offensives of European monarchies. The Germans, who offered resistance against the Napoleonic occupation, the Greeks who engaged in a struggle of liberation against Turkish domination, the disunited and scattered Poles, the Italians in the time of Garibaldi who felt themselves to be unredeemed under multiple foreign domination. All these could, in their national narcissism, still enjoy, so to speak, a primal innocence. What later with each decade could be seen more clearly probably still remained hidden to them. That patriotism and nationalism were the conscious self-programming of bourgeois ego pride that, taken seriously, immediately led to worrisome, indeed calamitous, developments. It was precisely in Germany that this innocence was lost early on. Already in Napoleonic times, Jean-Paul perceived that artful, self-reflectively mendacious element in Fichte's speeches to the German nation from 1808, that, seen in the light of day, are nothing other than a deliberate programming of a consciousness that is not one bit naive, but is supposed to be so. That it was Fichte, one of the greatest logicians of self-reflection in modern philosophy, who preached the love of fatherland to the Germans, reveals the vile, self-deceptive aspects of the earlier stages in German national feeling. Heinrich Heine also saw what was repulsive and affected in German patriotism from its first moment. National spontaneity was generated through pedagogy, indoctrination and propaganda until finally loud-mouthed national narcissism exploded militarily out of the ideological test tube in the early 20th century. It celebrated its greatest triumph in the European storm of emotion and war, euphoria. It celebrated its greatest triumph in the European storm of emotion and war euphoria in August 1914. Because of its synthetic nature, nationalistic mentality bears up badly when its narcissistic self-programming is disturbed. This is the reason for the rage of the bourgeois and petty bourgeois, which had constricted itself in a chauvinistic and elitist way against the self-reflective intelligentsia, which purportedly had such decomposing effects. In defending against the decomposition, Zersetzung, of its artificial naivete, bourgeois ideology manoeuvred itself into a position where it came into conflict with its own previous enlightenment. The cosmopolitan composure and universalistic nobleness of enlightenment must have become a thorn in the side of the political narcissism of the patriots. The oft-cited destruction of reason, quoting Lukács, in later bourgeois thinking, was deeply rooted in the narcissistic self-assertion of the bourgeois class ego against the forces of disillusionment that reflection inevitably exercises on it. Thus an alliance had to come about between enlightenment and socialist currents that initially knew how to avoid the willful self-delusion of a mentality of domination. The principal disturbance of nationalism arose, as could not be otherwise, from the political movement of the old fourth estate, the workers' movement. In it, a new political ego took the floor once more. It was no longer a bourgeois ego, but initially, and for a long time, it spoke a bourgeois language, 
Ideologically, socialism did not at first require its own weapon. It was enough simply to take the bourgeois at its word. Freedom, equality, solidarity. Only when it became evident that all this was not meant so literally did socialism have to forge its own critical weapon against bourgeois ideology, whereby initially it was forced to advance bourgeois ideals against a bourgeois double standard. Only with the theory of class consciousness did socialist doctrine elevate itself to a meta-moral standpoint. Ethically, the early workers' movement had every argument on its side, hence its erstwhile moral superiority. It pushed the process that began with bourgeois realism of labour a significant step further. For there is a proletarian consciousness of labour that clearly differs from that of the bourgeois. In it, an arch-realistic experience from the very bottom wants to gain political expression. One sweats for a whole lifetime and gets nowhere. Often there is not even enough to eat, while aggregate social wealth continually grows. One sees it in architecture, in the residences of those who rule, in the construction of cities, in the standard of the military forces, in the luxury consumption of others. Labourers do not participate in the growth of wealth, although they spend their whole lives in producing it. As soon as the labourer says, I, things must change. The political ego formation of the proletariat thus begins and proceeds differently from that of the bourgeois and the aristocracy. The labour ego intrudes into the public world with neither grandiosity of domination nor moral cultural hegemony. It possesses no primary narcissistic will to power. All previous workers' movements and socialisms failed because they disregarded this condition. In the aristocracy, the will to power is in politics and in life almost identical. It is anchored in the social structure as a status narcissism. Whatever is on top automatically experiences itself as the best, a political and existential excellence. In the bourgeois, class narcissism already becomes more ambivalent. On the one hand, it is linked to a merit that, through a permanent straining of moral, cultural and economic creativity, tries to earn cultural hegemony. On the other, it is nationalistically degraded. Thus, a will to power is not necessarily a will to govern, as was revealed by the notorious reluctance of the German bourgeois in the 19th and 20th centuries to get involved in politics. The bourgeois narcissisms can remain content with the will to profit, to success, and to culture. Finally, for the labourer ego, the will to power, and especially the will to govern, are only secondary motives, in which calculation, rather than passion, is at work. From the beginning, proletarian realism has two mutually contradictory dimensions. The first realism says, So that you get what you deserve, you yourself must make the move. No god, no kaiser, no tribune will give you, will give you what you need. Yeah. I think I've emphasised that sentence wrong. From the beginning, proletarian realism has two mutually contradictory dimensions. The first realism says, so that you get what you deserve, you yourself must make the move. No god, no kaiser, no tribune will give you what you need. You will only come out of your misery when you wake up politically and begin to participate in the game of power, as Poitier said in the Internationale. The second realism knows that politics means being called on to make sacrifices. Politics happens at levels where my immediate interests count for nothing, and where, according to Lenin, people are counted by the millions. In workers' realism, an ancient, deep-rooted mistrust of political politics lives on. The maxim, If you don't concern yourself with politics, then politics will concern itself with you. The basic formula for the politicisation of the proletariat 
has indeed been heard by labourers, but in the last instance it sounds like cynicism to them, like a well-formulated but vulgar notion. That they are the ones who must pay and sacrifice for politics is no secret to them. A primal wish, childlike and hyper-realistic at the same time, would be by contrast that such politics finally cease, and that, in good conscience, one finally would not have to bother about such things. All little people, not only labourers in the narrower sense, have felt the urge to stick out their tongues at the whole of politics. For this reason, in popular realism, jokes about politicians, including those about one's own party big shots, have provoked the heartiest laughter. The anti-political streak in labourers' consciousness already knows, of course, that politics represents a coercive relation that grows out of distress and conflict. Politics arises from a social clinch that can only satisfy those who are a, a priori the winners. The elite, the rich, the ambitious, those who feel that they are the best at making politics. The socialist encouragement of the labourer to get involved in politics thus always means a partial muzzling of proletarian realism. To experience the clinch of classes, parties and blocks willingly would be truly a harsh demand, and sometimes of the kind, and something of the kind is often an undertone in socialist politics, insofar as they are not already merely a language for new nationalisms. Herein lies one of the reasons why the political programming of the labourer ego, in the sense intended by ideologists, has failed throughout the whole world. It is obvious that the workers' movement, wherever it has become strong, has pushed through wage increases, social security benefits, chances to participate, and the first steps towards a redistribution of wealth. To date, however, no ideology has been able to talk has been able to talk it into a political will to power what to date however no ideology has been able to talk it into a real political will to power uh, it in that sentence must mean proletariat right okay a political realism is not so easily deceived Large-scale political mobilizations of the masses either presupposes wars or have their roots in a fascistoid theatrical orchestration of the masses. A symptom of this is that people are almost nowhere so nauseated by politics as in the so-called socialist countries, that is, in countries where the labourer ego officially is supposed to be in power. They perceive the party rhetoric largely as a prayer wheel, and as a parody of what they really want, a somewhat higher standard of living, a slackening of compulsions to work, liberalisations. It is one of the greatest ironies of modern history that no Western proletariat has been able to generate such spontaneous and disciplined strike movements as the socialist Poles of 1980, whose strike in fact expressed not a will to power, but rather the will to reduce suffering at the hands of power. It is the paradigm of proletarian realism, a strike against political politics and against the ideology of the eternal victim. This paradigm, of course, has its prehistory. In the workers' movement of the 19th century, two rival currents competed. These currents were based on the opposing realisms of proletarian consciousness, Marxism and anarchism. Marxism outlines the most consistent strategy of a socialist will to power as a will to govern, and even goes so far as to support a duty to power, so long as it is realistic to assume the existence of states and state politics. By contrast, anarchism has struggled since the very beginning against the state and political power machines as such. The social democratic, later communist line, thought it knew that the winning of bread, Kropotkin, the anarchists talked about, could lead only by way of hegemonic power in the state and the economic order. 
They believed that only as rulers of the state could the producers distribute social wealth to themselves indirectly through the state. None of the great communist theoreticians and politicians foresaw realistically enough that this strategy would probably end up in the exploitation of the workers by the agents of the state and military. In anarchism, by contrast, the need to be anti-political and the idea of self-determination were affirmed, and both were radically opposed to the idea. Oh God, another state, once again a state. The overprogramming of proletarian realism into a party identity can be studied since the 19th century as if it were a lab experiment. At first, the labourer ego finds in itself feelings of deficiency that can be politically stimulated, undernourishment, legislative demands, an awareness of being disadvantaged, claims on the fruits of one's own labour, etc. These basic motivations are now threaded into various strategies. Strategies are different because it is not clear from the motivations alone which path one can follow the fulfilment of these demands. The paths reflect the principal bifurcation in proletarian realism. Thus, against the tendency to class consciousness, there is a powerful privatism. Against the tendency towards a strategy in the state, a tendency towards a strategy against the state, against the parliamentary way, an anti-parliamentary way, against the idea of representation, the idea of self-management, and so on. Today the alternatives are called authoritarian and libertarian socialism. Splits in the workers' movement are rooted in such oppositions. The splitting is grounded in objectivity. Those who want to educate the proletarian ego to a party identity do violence to a part of its fundamental experiences and motivations. The communist branch of the workers' movement is, in fact, marked by a characteristically cynical cadre politics in which the leadership functions like a new brain that demands only precise functioning from the rest of the party body and that often even carries out a putsch against the basic programs of the old brain. The weakness in anarchism, on the other hand, is its inability to effectively organise the real life interests of the proletariat, which it surely understands better, for organisation is the domain of the authoritarian wing. Under the given conditions, there is no way to realise the ideas of self-management and self-sufficiency, or only on a small scale. It was no accident, therefore, that anarchism addressed not so much the proletarian anti-political instinct, which it wanted to support and strengthen, as petty bourgeois revoltism. The forces causing the split have systematically ruined the workers' movement. Of course, these forces not only follow the lines of the primal split, as outlined here, but are soon involved in a higher dynamic of splitting, a dynamic that is of a reflective nature. The formation of the proletarian ego is a process that, even more than the self-formation of the bourgeois between the 17th and 19th centuries, takes place in the laboratory of the public sphere. Here, no naivety is safe from reflection. In the long run, no swindle can occur here. What was true for nationalism holds even more for socialism. One looks on as it takes form, and as soon as it begins to make politics through fictions, it is struck by a contradiction, and that by no means merely from the outside, but even more from within. Every exclusive, self-satisfied and dogmatic self-programming can and must be broken down. A political movement does not base itself on existential realism and a science of society without paying a price. As soon as a fraction of the workers' movement appeared with the claim of knowing, and executing the correct politics, an opposing faction had to arise that contradicted the first and claimed to have better insight. This is the blind, purely mechanical reflexive tragedy of the socialist movement. Werner Sombart, a bourgeois economist whose fame today has faded, sarcastically counted at least 130 different varieties of socialism, and... A satirist today could easily keep on counting. 
the splits are the price of progress and reflection. Every half alert person recognises that party egos are produced in the test tube of propaganda and cannot be congruent with the realism at the base and the most elementary feelings toward life. One can see it with the naked eye. Here are programs searching for naiveties that are supposed to identify themselves. But no politics can, on the other hand, base itself on critique and science and, on the other, set its hopes on naivete and a system of blind devotion. Because every socialism wants to be a scientific Weltanschauung, it permanently regurgitates its own poison. Its realistic stomach spits out the slop of mere dogmatics. For most people today, the inner socialist debates from the revisionism dispute of the old social democracy up to the conglomerations of second, third and fourth internationals are as curious as the dispute among theologians of the 16th century over the interpretation of Holy Communion. They see in them what the historian also discovers through dis dispassionate research, that the formation of a unified proletarian ego oriented towards its own vital interests has failed. Up to now, the will to live and the will to power have set up two different accounts Precisely as the case of the proletarian ego, the fictions were weaker than the realisms. The programmers of political identity fought with each other from the beginning and got entangled in their printouts. The unified proletarian class ego is not a reality, but a myth. One recognises this myth easily when one observes the programmers and their public activities. Indeed, for a while they called themselves, with refreshing candour, Propagandists, disseminators of ideology. What also has played a role in the collapse of the socialist programming of identity is the psychological naivete of the old concept of politics. Socialism, especially in Western nations, has not known how to convincingly orchestrate the pleasure in making politics, or even the prospect of lessening suffering at the hands of politics. Its psychopolitics remained almost everywhere on a crude level. It could mobilise rage, hope, longing and ambition, but not what would have been decisive, namely the pleasure in being a proletarian. Precisely that, according to the socialist concept of the proletariat, is not at all possible since proletarian existence is defined negatively. To have nothing besides offspring and to remain excluded from better chances and the riches of life. Positive ego can only be achieved by deproletarianization. Only in the revolutionary prolet cult, which blossomed in Russia shortly after the October Revolution, was there something like a direct class narcissism, a self-celebration of the proletariat that soon had to wither under its own plaintiveness and mendacity. However, in political narcissism, just as in private narcissism, to be better is everything. Noblesse obligé. But can one say proletariat obligé? The proletarian ego, which follows in the footsteps of the bourgeois ego and registers its claim to an inheritance, possesses the class experience of working people who are beginning to overcome their political muteness. Every ego, in order to manifest itself and stand up to public scrutiny, requires a solid nucleus, a pride of ego, which can endure having to appear before others. The greatest breakthrough for the people came when they discovered the language of human rights for themselves. These rights were articulated from the peasant wars of 1525 up until the modern Russian and Polish resistances as the rights of Christians. In the traditions based on the American and French revolutions, they are understood as temporal, natural rights. The elevated feeling, composed of indignation and a claim to freedom, of being not a slave or a robot, but also a human being, gave the early workers' movement its moral, psychological and political strength, a strength that grew even more under repression. For this reason, the socialist movement had a competitor in the Christian workers' movement, 
which pursued the same motive, the feeling of being a meaningful human being politically and legally, but to be sure without the revolutionary element. For as long as the misery of the proletariat was so horrifying, as 19th century documents substantiate, even the discovery of the feeling for human rights had to give the labourer a political ego nucleus. This gives early and naive socialism a nostalgic charm, a moving political humanism filled with truth. But a sobering up comes about in the dispute over the correct interpretation of human rights. In the late 19th century, the age of strategy, of division, of revision and of fraternal conflict begins. The consciousness of human rights frayed in the gear wheels of the logic of party and struggle. It lost its capacity to sustain in the proletariat an elevated feeling firmly grounded in the public sphere when the socialist currents began to slander each other. Social democracy had already tried somewhat earlier in its cultural politics, Bildungspolitik, to stimulate this nerve of class narcissism by broadcasting the slogan, Knowledge is power. With this, the claim to its own class culture begins, a class culture rooted in the recognition that without a class-specific creativity and a superior morality and cultivation, no socialist state can be set up. Knowledge is power. This statement can also mean that socialism finally began to sense the secret of the relation between narcissistic pleasure and culture and political power. Quoting E. Kessner from his book Fabian, 1931, Being poor is no guarantee at all of being good and clever. In the heyday of the workers' movement, the consciousness of human rights was outbid by a proletarian pride and accomplishment that, for good reason, made reference to the labour, diligence and power of the class. Its knowledge of power culminated in the sentence, All we'll stand still if our strong arms so will. In the pathos of the general strike, something of the elevated feeling of class power and the domination of production lived on. Only, of course, under the almost always unrealistic assumption of proletarian unity. The latter was broken because vital interests and political interests could never coincide in the proletariat. Yet even the strength of a latent consciousness of the general strike and labour in the long run does not suffice to stabilise an elevated class feeling. The bleakness of everyday life is more powerful than the political learning and its dramatic episodes of class history. In the last instance, the consciousness of power and labour alone cannot sustain pride in a culture that can perpetually renew itself. The regeneratability of elevated feelings is rooted in the cultural and existential creativity of a class. In the end, mere power becomes boring, even to itself. Where the pleasure in politics reduces to the ambition of those who rule, a vital resistance of the masses is, in the long run, unavoidable. But in this lies also the germ of an objective proletarian feeling of inferiority. Wage labour creates abstract value. It is productive without being creative. The idiocy of industrial labour erects in the meantime uh, the idiocy, idiocy of industrial labour erects in the meantime an impenetrable wall against a true class narcissism of the proletariat. The cultural hegemony of those who produce, however, could only grow out of such a class narcissism. By contrast, a cultural system based on a crude ideology of labour is incapable of acquiring the most valuable inheritance of aristocratic and bourgeois culture the pleasure politics of a creative life. The socialist way of inheriting has intensified the old deficiencies and diminished the old privileges. In a civilization of the good life, to inherit from the nobility and the bourgeois can only mean avoiding the deficiencies of the predecessors and appropriating their strengths. Anything else would not be worth the trouble. <laughs>
I will forego presenting the establishment of inwardness in other areas, erotics, ethics, aesthetics, in the way I which in in the way in which I have briefly attempted to present it in the instance of the paradoxical inwardness of class narcissisms. In any case, the scheme of the critique would be the same. Investigation of collective program and self-programming. Today, the socio-cultural conditioning of the sexes is a common topic of discussion. The naive masculinity and femininity in the members of less developed cultures may strike us as charming. In our own context, we trip over the stupid factor and the results of such training. Today it can be expected of everyone to know that masculinity and femininity are formed in drawn out social self-training, just like class consciousness, professional ethics, character and personal tastes. Every person goes through years of apprenticeship and inwardness, every newborn child years of apprenticeship and gender identity. Later, in becoming aware of oneself, men and women discover a spontaneity of feeling constituted in such and such a way. I like her, I don't like him, those are my impulses, this turns me on, those are my wishes, I can satisfy them to this extent. From the first look we take at our experiences, we believe we can say who we are. The second look will make it clear that education is behind every particular way of being. What seemed to be nature, on closer observation, reveals itself as code. Why is that important? Well, those who enjoy advantages from their programming, and that of others, naturally feel no impulse to reflect. But those who suffer disadvantages will refuse in the future to make sacrifices based on a mere training and bondage. The disadvantaged are immediately motivated to reflect. One can say that the universal discontent in relations between the sexes today has led to a strong increase in the readiness to reflect on the causes of problematic relationships in both sexes. Wherever one gets involved with problems, one finds both sides sunk in reflection. And after reflection? Well, I know no one who could be said to be finished with reflecting. The labour of reflection never ends. It appears to be infinite. Of course, I believe it is a benign infinity, which implies growth and maturation. In innumerable respects, people have reasons to get to know themselves better. Whatever we may be, for better or worse, we are thus initially and naturally, quote-unquote, idiots of the family, in the broadest sense, educated people. Uh, footnote, this refers to a phrase from Marx concerning rural idiocy. Initially, we cannot help having been made by the family into the idiots we are. In the last instance, enlightenment has to do with the idiocy of the ego. It is difficult to disperse inner automatisms. It takes effort to penetrate the unconscious. A permanent critical self-reflection would be necessary in the end to counter the tendency to submerge oneself in new lacks of awareness, new automatisms, new blind identifications. Life, which also searches for new stability through revolutions and moments of awareness, obeys an inclination to inertia. The impression can thus arise that the history of spirit, Geistgeschichte, constitutes a simple dance of ideologies and not a systematically worked out movement of human cultures from immaturity and delusion. In the twilight of post-enlightenment, the idiocy of egos twists itself into postures that are more and more artful and more and more convoluted, into a conscious unconsciousness, into defensive identities. The mania for identity seems to be the deepest of the unconscious programmings, so deeply buried that it evades even attentive reflection for a long time. A formal somebody, as bearer of our social identifications, is, so to speak, programmed into us. It guarantees in almost every aspect the priority of what is alien over what is one's own. Where I seem to be, 
Others always went before me in order to automatize through socialization. Where I seem to be, others always went before me in order to automatize me through socialization. Our true self-experience and original nobodiness remains in this world buried under taboo and panic. Basically, however, no life has a name. The self-conscious nobody in us, who acquires name and identifies only through its social birth, remains the living source of freedom. The living nobody, in spite of the horror of socialization, remembers the energetic paradises beneath the personalities. Its life soil is the mentally alert body, which we should call not nobody, but yes body, and which is able to develop in the course of individuation from an arreflexive narcissism, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, an a reflexive narcissism to a reflected self discovery in the world cosmos. In this, nobody, uh, readers note, here when Slotted Ike uses the word nobody, it's capitalized, and the reason why it's capitalized is because he's making reference to the story of Odysseus, who cleverly fooled the um, Titan or giant, the Cyclope, um, fooled the Cyclops by. Um, saying that his name was nobody, so that when the Cyclops ran off saying, help, help, nobody has blinded me, the other Cyclops were like, okay, buddy. Um, anyway, I think he referenced that earlier in the book. Uh, in this nobody, the last enlightenment, as critique of the illusion of privacy and egoism comes to an end. If mystical advances into such innermost zones of pre-individual emptiness used to be exclusively a matter for meditative minorities. Today, there are good reasons for hoping that in our world, torn by struggling identifications, majorities for such enlightenment will finally be found. It is not infrequently necessary for the pure interest in surviving to be able to be nobody. The Odyssey demonstrates this in its funniest and most grandiose passage. Odysseus, the mentally alert hero, in the decisive moment of his wanderings after fleeing from the cave of the blinded Cyclops, calls to him, It was nobody who blinded you. In this way, one-eyedness and identity can be overcome. With this call, Odysseus, the master of clever self-preservation, reaches the summit of mental alertness. He leaves the sphere of primitive moral causalities, the web of revenge, from then on he is safe from the envy of the gods. The gods mock Cyclops when he demands that they take revenge. On whom? On nobody. The utopia of conscious life was, and remains, a world in which we all have a right to be Odysseus and to let that nobody live, in spite of history, politics, nationality and somebodiness. In the shape of our bodies, we should embark on the wanderings of a life that spares itself nothing. When in danger, mentally and spiritually alert persons discover being as nobody in themselves. Between the poles of nobodiness and somebodiness, the adventures and vicissitudes of conscious life are strung. In conscious life, every fiction of an ego is dissolved once and for all. For this reason, Odysseus, and not Hamlet, is the true founding father of modern and everlasting intelligence.